thunderous roar of a top fuel dragster doing a burnout. And yet here at State Capitol Raceway in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, racers from all over the country have come to compete in the ninth annual NHRA Cajun Nationals. Hi, I'm Ed Bruce. Today's racing will focus on the rocket fast top fuel dragsters, thundering funny cars, and the factory hot rod pro stockers. Right now, my buddies Brock Yates and Steve Evans are standing by to fill us in on today's action. Steve? Well, I'll tell you what, Ed, the people in this part of the world don't miss their one and only chance to see NHRA Championship drag racing. They have come from Louisiana, from Texas, Mississippi, Arkansas for three days. They have jammed this racetrack. It is the 10th Annual 7-Eleven Cajun Nationals. And they have come in every possible kind of conveyance, from motorhomes to old school buses, any way they could get here. And they are having some kind of fun. Round one action is over. It was sensational. We're headed down to the far end of the racetrack to bring you the round two interviews right now. Here's Brock Yates. Well, I'll tell you what, Steve. The fans are packed in here today in part for this reason. The Candies and Hughes team, surely the hometown favorites. from just down the road and home about an hour and a half south of here. They're the defending world champions in Funny Car, of course, and they came in here after having some problems earlier this season. But I'll tell you what, Mark Oswald qualified very, very well here and had a super race against Al Segrini in the first round. And this was that first round race earlier today. There's the bright red candies and Hughes car with Mark Oswald at the wheel, 30 years old from Cleves, Ohio. Oswald's opponent in that first round race was this man, Al Segrini of Southeastern Massachusetts. Segrini won the opening race of the NHRA season in California, the Winter Nationals, but since then has not seen very many wet lights. In the near lane, it was Al Segrini driving Joe Paisano's car, powered by the new JP1 engine. In the far lane, Candies and Hughes, of course, the car owned by Paul Candies, a native of this part of the country, and for Oswald, it was a first round victory at 605, 236 miles per hour. Al Segrini had problems right off the starting line, shut the car down. Round one also paired up a couple of Californians who have been dominant forces in funny car racing over the years. Dale Poldy on a roll this season, low qualifier here at uh, the Cajun Nationals, and has won a number of races. On a contrast, though, Don Perdome in kind of a slump. One of the great names, of course, in, uh, in the sport, but having troubles this season so far. But at the Cajuns, it was Poldy who had the problems. He simply laid down too much power, and Perdome went on to victory. Don, you said before first round, Poldy was apt to make a mistake, and you got that break you needed there. I made one, too. I threw a rod out. So that's why the motor was coming up like it was? It was just running its own oil? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, gosh, it left real good, and I thought everything was just fine, and bingo, I threw a rod out just a little ways off the start line. Huh? I'm just surprised it didn't uh, start a fire. So that means in all of this heat, the snake crew is going to be changing motors. Yeah, that's exactly what we're used to it, though. Okay. Time for Dome, going into round number two. A bit of luck. Well, Steve, round one also brought this young man to the line, Billy Meyer from Waco, Texas, number two man in the world championships last year. Kind of an iffy season so far this season, but Meyer always a competitor, always with frontline equipment, a new aerodynamic body on his machine. His competition was the 85 tempo entered by the Captain Crazy team from El Monte, California. The driver of the Bill Dunlap Owen car is Juan Correnti from Otterbein, Indiana. The latest in a long list of drivers, and at the finish line in Guadalupe, Correnti might have wished he hadn't applied for the job. Look at this, Brock, it just lit up. The engine blew, that is fuel and oil, trying to burn the tires and the parachute off the car. Well, fortunately, the chute stays intact, and that's helping to slow Ron down. Otherwise, he could have been in real trouble. He also manages to keep the car straight. Notice not a lot of fire in front of him, so he can pretty well pilot the car to a stop. Correnti deployed the onboard fire extinguishers, and that, coupled with the five-layer fire suit that is required in NHRA competition, permitted him to walk away from this bad fire. But you have to wonder how he was able to get this automobile ready for competition. Prior to round one, Steve stopped by his pits to talk to Ron about the problem. Well, about 18 hours ago, after his qualifying run, a very discouraged Ron Carini uh, didn't see himself racing today at the Cajun Nationals. And, Ron, I know you've been up all night. It still looks like the bottom of somebody's barbecue, but you're going to race, right? Yeah, we're going to race, for sure. Uh, we got it all back together now, and uh, we're going to be in there in round one. How about mentally? Oh, I'm up for it, yeah. It's, uh, we kicked a ride out. I've been through this before, and uh, I'm ready. Well, I know a few years ago you blew the body off at Gaines, but those are pretty frightening moments. I'm surprised you can you come back that quickly. I must be getting used to, like, driving in the dark. <laughs> well, good luck. Thank you very much. 
<laughs> well, the paint was scorched a little bit on Karani's tempo, but otherwise, with a fresh engine, he was ready to go against one of the strong runners, Billy Meyer. In round one competition, it was a wild one right from the start. Meyer crosses the line. Karani gets sideways, almost hits the fence, and pulls it out at the last second. Now, Karani had no idea Billy Meyer had crossed the center line. He was too busy driving his own race car. And boy, did he handle this machine. Now, watch Meyer, the Ford Mustang, and the right hand, the far lane. Meyer will definitely get over that center line, but Karenny, he's got his hands full as well. Karenny continues to impress me, Brock, as a race car driver. Uh, I think he can drive just about anything. Well, they were both headed for a collision at the uh, center of the track until finally Karenny got sideways a little bit and then aimed it at the fence. In the meantime, Meyer straightens it out, but he is already disqualified for crossing the line. So it was Karenny in that first round victory. Well, for Ron Karenny, if anything's worn out in this car, it's probably going to be the steering wheel. Boy, you had to use it. Oh, I'm telling you, she's slippery out there. Well, I know you were trying to stay out of Billy's lane the best you could, and you managed. And Billy was in mine, too. I mean, we were, we were knocking on the door. But uh, Perdome laid some oil down there, and boy, it was... As soon as I got to it, I felt it. <laughs> well, considering the uh, problems you had yesterday, it's got to feel especially good. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Yeah, it does. Ron Karenny goes into round number two. Well, Billy, you were having problems of your own, and when you got them corrected, you had to do what looked like some defensive driving. Well, I, I got over the center line, and it's a... Uh, uh, I could have gone ahead and probably won the race and stuff, but it's just too dangerous right beside him, and they got a rule that uh, you don't lose until you, the tire crosses completely over the center line, which that means half your car is over the center line. So theoretically, I could have, uh, you know, driven down the racetrack, but that's not the way to do it. It's been a game try, my man. Thank you. Well, it won't be two in a row for Billy Meyer here at the 7-Eleven Cajun Nationals. We'll be back with top fuel competition after this. Usual in the pit area at the 7-Eleven Cajun Nationals here in Baton Rouge. That is crew chief Bob Brent on Don Perdome's funny car. They are making the final adjustments after completing an engine change. Remember, Don blew his engine in that first race with Dale Puldy. And just down pit row, Steve is caught up with a man, Don B. For the 10th straight year, Dale Poldy becomes victim of the low qualifier jinx in Funny Car. Were you aware that the low qualifiers never won this race? Uh, Bernie said it several times over the PA, so I had it pretty well drilled into me. <laughs> uh, I didn't think that was going to be a problem, at least in the first round or two. But we just uh, overestimated the track. We got one good run out there yesterday. Didn't feel last night was going to show us anything for what was going to happen today. And um, we just took our chance at it, and we overestimated it. Well, this old war horse goes out uh, in with some blaze of glory, low qualifier. That's the last time for this car. It's a good car, and uh, I think that's what we're going to do is have our Buick ready to race next weekend and just wait for it to get here. A new Somerset? A new Somerset Regal. It's going to be the, a new car of its own. It's going to be different. See you at the Spring Nationals. You bet. More funny car action coming up, but right now, round one competition, top fuel. And Steve Evans, everybody recognizes that candy apple red car and the driver behind the wheel. Indeed they do, Brock. These folks know that Joe Amato is number one, the world champion. He'll be up against Tex and Gene Snow, who's logged a lot of miles down this Baton Rouge quarter mile. Now, Amato started the year off uh, good and bad. He won the opening race of the Winter Nationals, but exploded two superchargers right off the top of that engine. Came back to the Gator Nationals in Florida, the second race of the season, and again, supercharger problems. Some incredible explosions. So Amato right now is struggling just a little bit. Gene Snow, Fort Worth, Texas, he literally invented the bunny car, but now has fun as a sportsman racer in top fuel. Joe Amato, Old Forge, Pennsylvania, has an incredible automotive distributorship there, Brock, over 300 employees. And a fine, fine race driver as we watch his wife, Jerry, his constant companion on the starting line. She's the lady who will direct him back into the right lane, the right position. They'll seek the maximum traction on a racetrack that can, with the heat down here, Steve, get a little bit slippery. And it can change from round to round, Brock, depending on the heat, the humidity. We got plenty of both today. Jerry Amato, that's an important function she fulfilled. That car has got to be backed up exactly in those burnout tracks. Otherwise, the burnout was wasted. So, Amato in the near lane, that is the old veteran, Gene Snow, in a car that he calls Black Gold. And it's Black Gold that finances this man's racing. He's in all business in Portland, Texas. It is Amato with an early lead. Snow moves up even with it. Joe Amato. Jerry looks 
goes on and the scoreboard flag is a 567 245 mile an hour victory for the man from Pennsylvania. A fine, fine drag race all the way. Two professionals doing an excellent job of controlling these 3,000 horsepower monsters. They come out almost together. At the eight mile mark, Joe Amato has pulled out maybe a half a car length lead. Then it's Gene Snow who makes a terrific top end charge, but not enough. Joe wins it, stays with him. Well, Joe Amato, you enjoyed a three hundredth of a second hole shot right off the line of 567, put you in round two. Well, Steve, that was, it was a good run. The track seemed to have slowed down a little bit today. So we're kind of anxious to see what uh, Garlitz runs against uh, Connie Coletta. Because lane choice might be important, but the important thing is how fast they run. You know, we slowed down a little bit, but we thought we would. Well, in this heavy air, only in the 240s. Yeah, well, I shut it off a little early because, you know, when you're into the race, you want to save the motor for the next round. We've been plagued with some blower problems, so we're really trying to win the race. Well, there's been three races this season. You've made the finals of all of them. Going to do it again today? Well, you know, we don't want to make no predictions. The next round's really probably going to be the, we feel, the, the final. <laughs> okay, Joe Amato. Oh, you heard him say it. Joe is starting to get a little gun-shy about those blower explosions. Maybe you ought to talk to this man, Steve Evans, who has had every possible thing happen to him on a drag strip and uh, still continues to win in his middle 50s. Well, you, of course, are talking about Don Garland, Big Daddy. He is up against Connie Coletta. You're looking at 55 years worth of drag racing experience. Now, don't worry about the smoke coming out of Garland's engine there, you Garland fans. It does that, it seems like, every round. Connie Coletta, an old friend and an arch rival from Ypsilanti, Michigan, a race car driver and a professional pilot, owns a flying service. Don Garland, professional drag racer and currently the operator of the Don Garland Museum of Drag Racing in Ocala, Florida. Now, if you're a drag racing fan at all, you know from our coverage last year, Big Daddy came out of retirement to win the U.S. Nationals, backed it up with a World Finals victory. Now, sporting two new sponsors, he's going after the world title. But he's got a problem right now. The reverser is broken in that car. Now, the rules say if you can get pushed back by hand without inconveniencing the other guy, that's fine. And her parts and crew have done that. Now, Garland's had problems with that reverser even in qualifying. It has really yet to function during this entire event. You know, and I talked to Collada a little bit, Brock, this morning about Big Daddy not qualifying very well. He said, that doesn't matter. He doesn't care where he qualifies as long as he does. On race day, look out. <laughs> well, it looks a little like maybe Big Daddy needs a ring job in that thing at this point, but uh, don't count him out. Well, part of that smoke, Brock, is that he plums the uh, overflow pressure from the floor into one of the headers. So it's always squirting a little oil out of the supercharger into the header. It makes it look like the engine is hurt. So he could be hurt a little bit if he signs all of that. Not so. Look at Garlitz. He is driving away from Connie Collada. It is Don Garlitz by a car leg at 577, 243 miles an hour. He just keeps on winning. And by the way, Coletta has been on a very strong roll this year as he goes way down the end of the racetrack. No shootout for Connie, but this track is long enough so he brings that car to a halt without going into the men's room here behind the hay bales. So he'll be all right. But let's look at that one more time. That is Garland. Looks like maybe a little bit of an early leave on Connie. And from there on in, it's Big Daddy all the way. But I'll tell you what, this was some kind of an even drag race. The two race cars ran the quarter mile in identical ETs, 577, and it was only that quick reaction time at the starting line that spelled victory for Big Daddy. Well, Don, that transmission been giving you fits all weekend long. It's brand spanking new, and that's what the problem is. I hate new parts. It needs to be massaged by Big Daddy. It does. It's got to come all apart and be fixed inside so it's free. Well, you may uh, have to use some new parts on this one, 577? Yeah, it, it, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, well, a little bit of oil on Don's motor. I'm sure he'd like to get to that and start solving that problem before he goes into the second round up against Joe Amato. Well, he's got some work to do for sure, Steve. Some oil on that motor and his, uh, you said, a brand new reverser that needs to be fixed as well. So Big Daddy hits for the pits. We'll be back with more top fuel competition at State Capitol Dragway in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And the crowd, well, they're still arriving. The biggest ever in the 10-year history of the 7-Eleven Cajun Nationals. I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Gates and Ed Bruce. And those are the gloved hands of Gary Ormsby. Top fuel dragster driver and car dealer from Roseville, California. Former winner of the NHRA Winter Nationals. And he will be up against here in round one competition. The rookie, the one they call the kid. Daryl Gwynn from Miami, Florida. His first season of top fuel racing for the former world champion in the alcohol dragster ranks.
and a young man that a lot of people say has a great future in this business, Steve. A very heady driver, uh, part of a family-run team. And Darrell Gwynn listens to the old-timers, especially to the man up the road in Florida, Big Daddy Don Garlitz, who in a way has helped him along. And Gary Ormsby Brock has absolutely the cleanest operation I have ever seen in this sport. There's never any grit and grime on that car, the crew, their beautiful 18-wheeler. It is just spotless. I don't even know how they do it. An interesting car, too, Steve. That's a very long wheelbase uh, top fuel car that Gary has. And they worked around the rear wheels with some pods for some extra air management around those big rear wheels. Now, Daryl Gwynn may be a rookie in top fuel, but don't worry about his driving. The alcohol cars are almost as fast as the top fuelers. And as I said before, he's been a world champion in that category. But the thing they have to learn is how to adjust the nitromethane. It is just a whole nother animal. If the motor is a little lean, you burn it up. You blow the floor up. Alcohol in the tank is very forgiving. Not this stuff. It sure isn't. And now they're running percentages almost 100%. Remember when 50% nitro was a big deal. Now 98% is common. Just like loading up your fuel tank with liquid TNT. Indeed it is. And it's very expensive stuff. Almost $40 a gallon. They both smoke the tires right up the starting line. This will be a driver's race. Gary Ornsby, too near the center line to stay on the throttle. Daryl Gwynn wins it with a very slow 639, 222 miles an hour. But he'll take it anyway. Brock, the racetrack is just not quite as good as it was in qualifying. We saw Dale Poley overpowered in funny car. Now both of these drivers just blazed the tires. They had to get off the throttle, back on it again, trying to get that smoke to dry up. Well, we remember the Meyer Carretti race. A very similar situation here. This racetrack is going to be mighty tricky as the day carries on here as we see Ormsby almost get into the side of Darrell Gwynn. Loses it when he crosses the line. Well, even though he had to fight from the starting line to the finish line for it, that was Darrell Gwynn's first ever national event victory. Congratulations, Darrell. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, we know that we weren't going to win races right off the bat. We're still at a learning stage right now, but uh, we'll take them as we can get them. I'll tell you, we don't plan on winning these first couple races, but uh, anything can happen. Could you see Gary Ormsby? He was having big trouble across the center line. Yeah, I saw him right next to me. Yep, we were all having troubles. It's, it's anybody's race once you get in the field, though. Well, they call you the kid, but uh, this sport will mature you very fast. Well, I don't know. There's a bunch of old guys in this class. I'm the youngest, so... <laughs> see you in the second round. Thank you. So the learning curve continues to go upward for this young man on his way to a probable championship somewhere down the road. All right, back in the pit area, that is the man, the snake, doing a hydrometer reading on his nitromethane mixture because he's got a heavy hitter up against him in the next round of 20 cars. That is Jim Head, so he'll need a heavy percentage of nitro. But right now, it's going to be more top fuel competition. That is one of the great names in his business, Gary Beck. Well, Gary Beckbrock is still the world record holder for a lap time in 5.39 seconds, but has not come close to that number in about a year. Still struggling with the fuel system. They lost a favored supercharger and just haven't found another one to match it. So still part of the Vaughn and Larry Miner team from Hemet, California. Gary Beck, now something of an underdog, Steve. Alabama's Bill Mullen came out strong. His very first shot of the Cajun Nationals, a 5.56, which held up as the number two qualifier. Only Joe Amato ran a little bit quicker, but he came back for another qualifying run, and this was the result. A horrible engine explosion blo broke a couple of connecting rods. A little bit of fire resulted. Bill was okay. The car was okay. And as you can see, there is a motor back in. Again, at this car, he will race Gary Beck in round one. Now, uh, is that the motor that you ran 5.56 with, Bill? Yeah, we took the good motor out, and uh, we wanted to save it for the second round if we got by the first round. And uh, uh, fortunately, it's in good shape. We uh, we hurt the spare motor, and we last night, John stayed up all night, and the rest of us stayed up part of the night and fixed uh, another spare motor. So this one uh, doesn't necessarily have to carry you through the day? No, we've got another complete motor sitting in there and a block assembly, too, ready to go. Does a top field driver have any idea when he's on fire like that? Can you feel any heat at all with it behind you? I felt the uh, vibration. I couldn't feel the heat. I guess the wind was taking it all away, but I felt the vibration. I felt like it kicked the rods out of it. It indeed did. Yeah, <laughs> made a mess, that's for sure. 
Well, John Kerry, the chief mechanic and car owner in that car, a renowned diesel expert in the southeastern United States, and he and his crew bolted that, inch it back together, and Mullen is ready to go. You know, I think when you've been working on those great big diesel motors as many years as John Kerry, that these little aluminum racing engines are just like toys. I mean, he goes out here, explodes them, and it doesn't even phase him, Brock. That kind of work or broken parts doesn't mean anything to a guy used to working on those great big heavy equipment engines. <laughs> Yeah, these things are only about 500 cubic inches. Little toys, really. Let's see how this race comes out. It was Bill Mullen off the mark first. Bill Mullen, Gary McWheel, the wheel. The electronic finish line judge says Bill Mullen. Identical elapsed times. Both of them run 574. The second race today, we have seen identical ETs. Now watch the car in the far lane. Indeed, off the mark first just by a wink but that is enough to spell the margin of victory because gary beck stayed with bill mullins the entire quarter mile fantastic drag race one that you will very seldom see much closer looks more like a pro stock competition the race cars are so close at the finish line but mullins pulls it out oh boy thank goodness for electronics because the human eye could never have called that at over 240 miles per hour that's a drag race so on top fuel the semifinals we have this to look forward to mullins versus gwen mullins will have lane choice he ran quicker it will be world champion joe amato versus big daddy don garland's the second half of the semis let's go to ed the top fuel dragsters always generate lots of excitement sometimes the matchups and personalities of particular drivers just seem to intensify the competitive spirit Let's take a look back at one such race. It was first round competition in Tough Fuel, matching Connie Coletta in a brand new car against Shirley Muldowney racing in the near lane. The history of Connie and Shirley's past involvement is well publicized, and it seemed to make each meeting between the two a tremendous battle. Both cars completed their burnouts and backed into the starting lanes. Shirley approached the line when suddenly we know something was wrong with Connie's car. It was stuck in reverse. He couldn't get it into forward. Shirley's car was now staged, and her engine was possibly in danger of becoming too hot. Starter Buster Couch was waiting to see if Connie could solve the problem. And finally, too much time had elapsed, and he started the race, just as Connie got his car working. Shirley went on to win the race, and Connie Coletta was hopping mad. But after all, that's what you'd expect, because those are the kinds of things of which rivalries are made. Fellas? <laughs> Well, Ed, you don't always need race cars to get a little action at a drag race when Connie Coletta's around. All right, now, round two action, funny cars, Steve's in the pits. Jim Head and crew are running just a little bit behind the rest of the competitors getting ready for round number two. They had to put a spare engine in the car, and it's taken them an awful long time because the original motor, this one that I'm kneeling with right here, uh, wasn't discovered to be faulty until the last minute. The diver, as they call the guy that lays under and checks the bearings, signaled them that they had spun some rod bearings. Jim said, they're really not that bad. A lot of people might have run this engine, including himself, but he said, I had a fresh motor that I had a lot of confidence confidence in and I didn't want to take a chance of burning the car up so Jim Head will be ready for round number two you can bet on that and this is a special race for him it signaled the start really of his pro career with a runner-up finish a year ago well Steve Head and the guys better spin the wrenches because we've got the first pair ready to go it'll be the Hawaiian with Rick Johnson at the wheel he'll go against Californian John Force champion Joe Amato. His crew chief Tim Richards taking extra precautions getting this motor ready because in the second round they will face off with Big Daddy Don Garland. Could be the race of the day at the 7-Eleven Cajun Nationals. I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Gates and Ed Bruce and that man under the motor has maybe the dirtiest job in all the drag racing checking the bearings but one of the most important ones because if anything is wrong in that bottom end it means the motor has to come out of the car. This is second round funny car action back at the starting line. Rick Johnson and Roland Leon's famed Hawaiian Dodge Daytona car up against the beautiful Corvette-bodied automobile in the far lane of John Brute Forest from Southern California. Now, neither of these drivers has ever scored an NHRA major event victory, but for John Forrest, it can't be far away. He's been runner-up, in fact, right here at the Cajun Nationals. Rick Johnson, earlier this year, recorded the quickest elapsed time in the history of funny car racing at 5.58 seconds. The roof hatch opened, Brock Yates, uh, to let a little of that burnout smoke uh, escape. Yeah, no air conditioning on these babies, Steve. You know, this could be a mighty interesting race. This track is getting very treacherous. The heat's getting higher and higher all the time. We've seen some real sideways motoring in a couple of the other rounds. Perenni and Meyer come to mind. Boy, that was a wild one. And uh, this racetrack could cause some real problems for these guys. Indeed it could. You know, John Forrest has been working very hard on his driving. 
they changed the throttle in the car before the Cajun National to what they call a long throttle. So it has more travel and uh, more sensitivity down the racetrack. We don't often hear it, Brock, but a lot of times these drivers are on and off that throttle trying to keep those tires hooked up and not smoking. Well, I would imagine they've made some uh, pretty severe clutch adjustments in these cars because a couple of guys have just gone up and smoked, just uh, overpowered the racetrack, as you say. And uh, I would imagine that some pretty serious thoughts gone into clutch adjustments on these race cars. Well, the clutch on these cars can be as important as the engine because if the clutch locks up too soon, too much of that 3,000 horsepower goes to the rear tires, and you see them smoke, and that's a very easy way to lose a drag race. They move up the stage, and the near lane is Rick Johnson. In the far lane is John. On fours, both cars based in Southern California. You see him tickling those electronic beams. Forced, the last to move in. We are ready. Starter Buster Cat will send them on their way. It is John Force off the line first. Rick Johnson near that center line. He did not cross it. John Force is there first by a car length. A 597, 244 miles an hour. And both crews appeared to have guessed right on that clutch. At least they got down the racetrack without any tire smoke. John Force will go to the semifinals. And proving that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. That was John Force. Rick Johnson, on the other hand, kind of takes the long way around. He goes kind of a curvaceous route out toward the center line almost crosses it right here it gets the car straightened out but at that point it's forced home by almost a car and a half well john did you have to use that long throttle on that victory believe it or not steve didn't have to the guys coiling them they had her they had her dialed in uh only thing really happened and i just had to do a little growing up me and coil talked about a just uh, mental attitude on that start line and the whole thing of concentrating on the race and uh, after 10 years of standing here with you i can't believe i'm still learning every day <laughs> rick johnson was no easy one no no it scares me there are likes of uh roland's been doing this a long time johnson's tough he's a good old boy but he's tough out there and uh i'm glad we beat him okay going to the semifinals. obviously happy is john force he sure is, Steve, and one of the most dedicated, hard-working, funny car racers in the business. The next pairing, a mighty, mighty interesting combination. Oswald versus Bernstein. Bernstein car, an interesting component in there. That's a computer you're looking at, Brock. And computers are not new to drag racing, but this particular type is revolutionary. And they're really not talking too much about it. They're monitoring a whole lot of functions in that automobile. Something is working because they have won the last two races on the circuit, the Gator Nationals and the Southern Nationals pulled both ends of the national record, ET and mile an hour. So the crew chief, Dale Armstrong, working with Kenny Bernstein, have got some serious speed secrets in that particular Ford-bodied automobile. So while uh, Bernstein and crew have definitely found a combination, Oswald and Candice and Hughes, after winning the world championship, are much like Gary Beck. They have sort of lost the combination. They just can't seem to make that race car work the way it is traditionally run, as we see Leonard Hughes, an old drag racer himself, helping to put that car for on the line. But right now, the pressure is definitely on Mark Oswald. Hometown crowd, a crowd that expects this race car to really perform. And so far, it has not been working very well during this entire season. Mark Oswald, world champion, hired gun from Cleves, Ohio, outside Cincinnati in the Candies and Hughes car. Kenny Bernstein and his big story, of course, the computer. Steve looked at it earlier. One of the reasons why Kenny Bernstein has won the last two NHRA national events and holds both ends of the national speed records may be this. Under four pounds, a little black box. Now, you've probably already guessed it is a computer. Now, we've talked about computers before on his car, but they were big, they were bulky, they wouldn't take the pain and strain of drag racing. This one is bulletproof. This is the actual computer that goes into the car before every run. It is then unbolted out of the car, goes into the trailer where this very simple, inexpensive computer is plugged in. But the data that comes out of the box is in anything but simple. There's more than I could even recount to you. It takes 40 readings a second. It tells you the engine RPM every point down the racetrack. It tells them when Kenny shifts from first into high gear. It gives them a complete fuel flow graph. It tells you the shaft speed and the engine speed so you know the clutch slippage. Just incredible information that soon everybody may be privy to because they plan to market this unit in all forms of motor racing for under $3,000. Quite a bargain. Dale Armstrong and Kenny Bernstein have really broken some ground here. <laughs> what a deal. If they could only get those things to get more than about 0.5 miles of the gallon, they'd really be onto something. <laughs> right now, though, Kenny Bernstein and Mark Oswald go to the line. 
And you wonder when you buy that computer if you get the same one. You know what I mean, Brock? <laughs> <laughs> well, Kenny is really doing a job. He and that crew have come to a point where they are almost indomitable. This is any time you go up against them, it's a David and Goliath act here. And right now, here's David. That is Mark Oswald inside the Candies and Hughes cockpit. Well, this will be a disappointed crowd if that red car in the near lane can't get to the finish line. They just live and breathe for that particular machine. And it's not going to happen. It is going to be Kenny Bernstein by a country mile. Oh, boy. He is really going to have them talking to themselves with this one. A 576, 245 miles an hour when everyone else is stuck in the sixes and the 590s. Bernstein is dominant here. Car action here at the 7-Eleven Cajun Nationals. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm Brock Gates along with Steve Evans and Bruce here as well. The temperature's going up. The engines are fired. That is Ron Coretti's Captain Crazy Car. Remember, you saw it on fire during the qualifying round. And then a wild race in which he beat out Texan Billy Meyer. Corrente up against one of the really nice guys in this business, John Collins. He is a treat to be around. You're right, Brock. Now, his competition, Ron Corrente from Indiana, has been knocking around this sport for years in top fuel and funny car. As I mentioned earlier, new to this ride. John Collins, when he's not racing the quarter mile, he's racing cutting horses on the family spread in Oklahoma. You know, Brock, I can't imagine John Collins can even come to the starting line here in Baton Rouge without remembering that incredible two-car collision with Ed McCullough just a year ago. But he's back. A lot of people said he couldn't recoup, but he sure did. And back in a big way. He's been running very, very well with that funny car in the last couple of races. But still, the big victory eludes John Collins, as it does Ron Coretti. Neither one of these guys may have a major victory under their belt. And I'll tell you what, if they flambe that Captain Crazy car one more time, there won't be enough left of it to race. That wasn't the only fire that car has suffered. You know, they worked so hard between rounds to get these cars ready. Well, there's a new device that'll help greatly in the area of the clutch. I looked at it earlier. Drag racers just love gadgets. Anything that'll save them time on the racetrack or in the pit. Now, this is a clutch disc. There's four of these in the slider clutches in the top fuel directors and funny cars. When the car is serviced in the pits, these discs are red hot. They are warped. They have got to be made flat again. Now, Fred Miller here from the Blue Master. This is how Fred has had to do it for years. Grind both sides of all four discs, a very time-consuming and inaccurate procedure. Now, Tony McGlazy here has developed the portable disc grinder. He and his son, Lonnie, build slider clutches. Look at this gadget. Boy, the racers are going to love this. The disc goes on. There's an abrasive uh, sanding disc in the box. Push the button. It spins it up to 400 RPMs and will grind it to any tolerance you like. You shut the door so all the dust and little pieces go out the bottom instead of in the atmosphere. I tell you, this could save uh, up to 10 or 15 minutes getting a car ready for the next round. It only sells for $500. Uh, well, I'll tell you, this gadget's going to be real popular. Could replace tape decks is the next big phrase in the car business, Steve. <laughs> as we watch Ron Corrini and the Captain Crazy Car get ready to go against Collins. It is John Collins off the mark first. But here comes Corrini. He is really driving that race car, and he gets there first. Lots of smoke, but no sign of any fire. How about Corrini? He was off the mark a little late, but he sure made up for it down the course. He wins it at 596, 242 miles an hour. Terrific drive by Corretti. This is a big surprise. This Captain Crazy Car is running as well as it's ever run. We sort of thought Collins might have him. There's a lot of smoke. Corretti looks like he's going a little sideways all over the racetrack. Collins goes straight, but in the end, it's Ron Corretti by a wink. Terrific drag race. Okay, he'll go into the semifinal round. Something of an underdog. Well, the body may be a bit flambéed, but for Ron Corrini, this is his best day in national event funny car racing. Good, good job. Thank you very much, Steve. Lots of smoke. Uh, we heard it that time. Uh, we got some work to do. Have you got the parts in the pieces? Yeah, we got the parts. Yeah, we'll be back. <laughs> some way, we'll be back. Well, you've already proven that coming back from that fire on Friday. Thank you. All right, Ron Corrini got some work, as he says, back in the pit area. They hurt that motor pretty badly. A disappointed and a somewhat surprised John Collins comes over. Always a traditional handshake at the far end of the racetrack. These competitors very, very much sportsmen when it is all over. All right, the next pair, the big name, Don Perdome against the unsponsored car from Columbus, Ohio. Jim had probably one of the biggest upset winners in the history of drag racing when he won the U.S. Nationals last year, Steve. And he won the U.S. Nationals, Brock, not with sheer power, but by not making mistakes. When you go up to race Jim Head, you beat him. He 
seldom beats himself. And remember, these are both new power plants since the first round, uh, unproven in some ways. Interesting strategy. He had to use. He's a lot like a golfer who doesn't hit very far off the tee, but always stays in the middle of the fairway. Very consistent, very conservative. Jim had knocked around this board for a long time and top fuel cars and funny cars. He's up against one of the greats in this sport, Don Perdome, a pioneer in top fuel cars, four-time world champion in the funny cars. Don Perdome was the first to ever top 250 miles an hour, and he did it a couple of years ago on this very racetrack. Boy, Jim Head's car is pretty, isn't it, Brock? It sure is. Uh, doesn't have a whole lot of sponsor decals on it, but uh, the paint job is beautiful, and it's a very simple, very clean operation. Kind of symbolic of the way he runs his pole racing program. Now, Head is not a full-time professional. Uh, he and his family operate uh, a big electrical contracting firm in the central Ohio area. Now, Head wants to race. He's moving up to the starting line. Perdome taking another uh, shot at a very short burnout. The uh, drag racers call them dry hops. I wonder if that is a result of this racetrack getting slipperier, Steve. Perdome, I believe, has shut his car off. He has. Perdome, not liking the sound of it, shuts it off. It'll be Jim Head on a single run. And I could have told you this had happened. Jim Head is not going to make an all-out run. He doesn't care about lane choice. He cares more about saving the nitromethane and the parts. And there is one very disappointed Don Perdome. His adrenaline was up. He was ready to race, and suddenly the engine shut down, and he is out of it for the day. A very tough break for the former world champion. Okay. The Funny Car semifinal pairings will have a couple of new faces. Ron Coretti versus Jim Head, Forrest versus Kenny Bernstein. Bernstein, of course, the most familiar and the most successful of that lot. As Don Perdome gets ready to go, let's go to Steve, who's in the Kenny Bernstein pit as he gets ready for his next run. Well, you've got to be a lot of things in this sport, including a chemist, as Kenny Bernstein takes a measurement on the nitro reading. Uh, can you tell us how much? Sure, we're up to 94% today. Which 94%? Is quite, yeah, it's quite a bit for us, or for most of them, but you've got to realize it's real hot out, and the hotter out it is, the more you can actually put in it, so it's a little different today than normal. You know, of the cars remaining, John Force is not the one you wanted. No, I've got the, the tough ladder side today. Needless to say, we started off with a, a tough one, and then we got Oswald in the second, and Force is, like you say, I could have picked a lot better. Of course, can beat you on desire. Well, he can. He's a very, very hard competitor, and he wants to win as badly as anybody does. And uh, don't forget, he's got an excellent crew chief over there also in Austin Coyle. Should be a good car race. It will be. No question about it. Well, hardcore drag racing fans will recognize the name Austin Coyle. He is the man who wrenched the Chi Town Hustler to two world championships with Frank Hawley at the wheel, Steve Evans, and definitely a, one of the best guys in this business when it comes to preparing a funny car. Well, that's Austin right there getting John Force's car ready. Uh, Austin Coyle, next to Dale Armstrong on Kenny's crew, is probably the highest paid wrench the drag racing sport has ever seen, and he deserves every dime of it. This is an 80-hour week business. And mostly involved with a fuel system these days, Steve. The rest of the engines are pretty basic, but the technology of fuel systems continues to advance, and Coyle is one of the few guys who understands it. Let's see how well it works for him when his car goes in the next round of Funny Cars. Goes for the big surprise in Funny Cars, Ron Carretti getting into the semifinals. Steve is in his pit. Okay, Brock, Donnie Couch, one of the mechanics on the Captain Crazy car, just hollered out, it got the crank. And that's the worst thing that you can possibly hear, and it generally means that an engine change may have to occur here after everything else these guys have gone through. Donnie, you got the crankshaft? Yeah, but I think we can sand it off. All right, they're going to try to use some emery cloth and sand what they call the black death off of the crankshaft. We'll update you, Brock, as if, if they can do that. Well, Steve, these guys are notorious innovators, and uh, if there is a chance to field strip that engine and make it work for the short term, they'll do it. All right, the competition here, of course, is Jim Head. That is his crew hard at work. That's Jim himself wrenching the car. He's right in there with the rest of the crew all the way. Well, there's nothing fun about this particular job here, Brock. That's the diver I referred to earlier. 90 degrees outside, 90% humidity, oil running in his eyes as he checks the bearings. Let's take a break and go to Ed Bruce. The Cajun Nationals have provided drag racing fans with many exciting moments to remember. Some thrilling, some bone chilling. See if you can remember this action from last year's Cajun competitions. In the funny cars, it was John Collins and Ed McCulloch.
Without a doubt, one of the most incredible crashes in the history of drag racing. Let's take another look at the crash in slow motion to analyze what happened. John Collins in the far lane and Ed McCulloch in the near lane. At first, both cars appeared to be okay. Then suddenly, McCulloch lost control and slammed into John Collins. Collins' car spun and rolled over as Ed McCulloch's car got up on the razor edge of the guardrail. Then McCulloch's car dropped off the guardrail, and in front of Collins, it careened across the track once more and exploded in flames against the guardrail. At this point, both cars were upside down and consumed in flames. Finally at rest, and it was then we noticed raw fuel was pouring out of Collins' car. But luckily, it didn't ignite. And then miraculously, both men emerged, shaken up, but unhurt. A real tribute to the strict safety requirements of the NHRA. And Ed, we see why. The rare two-car collision is the most dreaded accident in drag racing. Here's an update on the Ron Carini situation. The motor is staying in the car. They have sanded that crankshaft. And crankshaft damage broad has to be taken very seriously because if that crankshaft breaks or seizes on a run, that is the quickest way there is to burn one of these cars right to the ground. You're absolutely right. So the Carini car getting ready to go as we get into the pro stock ranks. That, of course, is Etta Glidden, Bob's wife, the lady who has done so much to make this particular car the fastest in the business. And this will be an all Thunderbird affair, Brock, in the far lane. That is Frank Iaconio from New Jersey, his first year with a Ford product. He has been a Chevrolet man his entire career. But with Bob Glidden from Indiana running as he has been with that Ford Thunderbird, I guess uh, Iaconio just said, I better switch. Well, Steve, remember that Glidden had about a season trying to get this car right. Iaconio still having teething Antonio was off the starting line late. Rarely will you see that. Glidden was right on time and wins it by well over a car length. A nice elapsed time, 7.68 seconds, 182 miles an hour. Let's take a look at it one more time off the starting line, and I'm sure you'll see the advantage Bob Glidden enjoyed. You sure do. Right there, Glidden in the blue and white Thunderbird in the left side of your screen out early. And from there on in, it's just a straight pass for Glidden. So consistent. Iaconio, as you say, surprisingly light. But it may be that he's still distracted with trying to get that Ford Thunderbird sorted out. So Glidden on the threshold of another championship. Going into the finals of the Cajuns, the Ford Thundering. We've, uh, we've come through this thing so far, Steve. We lucked through the last race at Atlanta. Uh, we need one more round here, and we'll be looking really good. Okay, go get him. Well, as you know, the main winningest man in modern drag racing history, Bob Glidden, gets ready to go back. He'll tweak that motor a little bit more and get ready for the final round. His opponent will be one of these two next men on the lineup. Warren Johnson, Ken Dondero, Camaro versus Oldsmobile. Ken Dondero from California, a longtime veteran known to be a fine driver. Warren Johnson, on the other hand, a technical expert, the only man really to make these big displacement Oldsmobile engines work. He has been really the arch rival of Glidden over the last couple of seasons, now living in Duluth, Georgia, where he makes those 500 cubic inch Oldsmobile engines just sing. Ken Dondero, Balboa Island, retired for a while, ran very well in the sportsman ranks in his younger days, now back into pro stock and known, as I said before, to be one of the finest pure drivers in this business. But so it's going to be driving style against raw horsepower. This little Oldsmobile Calais of Warren Johnson's. They had some handling problems with it earlier in the season. They seem to have that sorted out. So, Warren Johnson a little bit early. Looks as though he's carving out a slight advantage over Dondero. He goes on to take a two-car length victory. 762, 181 miles an hour, setting the stage for a Glidden-Johnson shootout in the finals. Okay, with that stage set, let's go back to the pit area. Don Garlitz and Steve Evans. Well, Don, your car looks all ready for round number two. Uh, you must be getting ready for round number three. That's confidence. <laughs> you got to look at this with a positive outlook. <laughs> you know, even though 100 miles of barbed wire hit us straight in the face, we're still marching forward. <laughs> the curse over you got that reverser fixed. It's about 90 degrees oh, outside. You can't hardly take that. And look at what it's doing to the engine. It's backside in the engine before it ever gets back. So the reverser going out actually affects the motor? It kills the motor. Yeah, we had blue smoke puffing before we ever got back to the finish line, starting line. Let's hope she backs up under her own power. Huh? We got a trans got an old transmission in there now. It should be fine. You hate those new parts. Oh, I hate them. <laughs> well, you got to massage them. <laughs> <laughs> 
what a character. One of the greatest in the history of this sport. Don Garlitz ready to go. We'll be back with him and more action right after this. Fuel coming up has brought all the people out of the pits and back into the grandstand. The first pair already on the starting line, fired and ready. It will be Bill Mullins from Alabama against this young man, Daryl Gwynn. And when I say young, I mean 21. But I'll tell you what, a real veteran in terms of miles on a drag strip. Came from a drag racing family, father raced, and as you said earlier, Steve, has a world championship and top alcohol drag store under his belt. So this is far from a novice going to the line here. And it's all brand new, fresh equipment for the Gwen family. On the other hand, in the far lane is 50-year-old Bill Mullins driving for John and Shirley Carey. Now that used to be the Jody Smart Top fuel car, so it has got a lot of miles on it. And as we saw earlier in qualifying, they have already had one engine explosion. They had one also at the Gator Nationals earlier this year. They are not afraid to kaboom that motor if that's what it takes to get to the finish line. Well, they're a mighty, mighty tough combination. Remember, they put away Gary back in the last round with identical ET. So Mullins are very poised and a very, very competent race driver. Now, Daryl Gwen in his first round win, smoked the tires. In fact, didn't even get into the five second elapsed time zone. So I'm sure some clutch adjustments have gone on in that camp. Interesting confrontation. Bill Mullins, uh, like Don Garlitz in his early 50s, been around the business forever. Daryl Gwen, uh, racing like a man uh, with about 30 years of experience. There goes a handshake from his father as Daryl Gwynn gets ready to go to stage that car. Imagine what it's like for a kid that age to be uh, sitting in front of 3,000 horsepower. Got to be a little bit like riding a rocket sled, Brock. They take uh, four, five Gs right off the starting line, then negative Gs when the parachute hits. Here we see the new style front wheels engineered by Goodyear to keep those front tires in place. Tire smoke up in Daryl Gwen's car. And it is a lots of traction that spells defeat for Daryl Gwen. How about Mullins? He picks up a full tenth over his first round race, a 567, 254 miles an hour. Bill Mullins will go into the final round of the Cajun Nationals. The next pair lit and ready and brought. From the fans' point of view, this is the race of the day. Big Daddy Don Garlitz against Joe Amato. Big Daddy, of course, in his third decade of big time drag racing, recorded something more miles on a drag strip than any man, a, thousands of miles, a quarter mile at a time, against Joe Amato, the prosperous businessman, defending world champion, not anywhere near as much experience as Garlitz, but a very devoted drag racer nonetheless. This is going to be an interesting race. Like Bill Mullins, Joe Amato is a veteran of the top alcohol dragster rakes. Bill Mullen, of course, is already set for the finals. Well, a very strong, oil-free 567, Bill Mullen. We're happy with that. We'll take a win any way we can get it. And in this kind of heat, to just have those tires stick for a quarter of a mile is a triumph. Well, we had a lot of a lot of tire shake, and I shifted it real early, and I was afraid it might hurt it, but it, it seemed to come out all right. Who would you like to race in the final, Joe Amato or Don Garlitz? I don't mind either one as long as I can beat them. <laughs> you know, we're just going to need a lot of luck, that's for sure. They're two legends, you know. It's just going to be... It's a thrill to get to run either one of them. Well, let's go back to the starting line and see just exactly who will race Bill Mullen in the final of the 10th Annual 7-Eleven Cajun Nationals. Well, we'll have that information in a matter of seconds, Steve, as Amato stages. There's his wife, Jerry, standing by, fingers crossed. He's up against the legend of all legends, Big Daddy Don Garlitz. They stayed very carefully. Garlitz and his homemade car. It is Amato up the mark first. Joe Amato left first. Here comes the black car. It is Garlitz having to drive around Amato. And oh, my, low lap time of the event. 5.55 seconds at 255 miles an hour. No shoot on Garlitz, but he's going to be okay. He's been in those sand traps before. He sure has. Let's have another look as Garlitz has to face a perfect light from Joe Amato. Amato away just a wink sooner, and it turns out to be just raw horsepower from that slightly smoking engine of Big Daddy's as he drives by Joe Amato for the victory. Well, for the first time this season, world champion Joe Amato will not be in the final round, but he still musters a grin. Well, Steve, it's a tough race. We knew it was going to be. You know, Don's a tough racer. And it's going to be an exciting championship this year. You know, that's why the winner is going to definitely really enjoy the, the rewards. You left first, and then all of a sudden here came that black car like a freight train. Yeah, my car seemed like it laid down in the middle. You know, the, the people 
you know, I feel like bad for the crew in a way, you know, because uh, Tim Richards and my crew and my sponsors, all my fans, they do a good job. And when you won't win, you feel like, you know, you let them down, you know. I did my best leaving the line, and the car just didn't have enough power, you know. Well, just missing your first final in four races, uh, it's not going to cost you any fans, Joe. No, well, the track was the big thing. We weren't sure how much power the track would take, and we were a little bit afraid of it, you know. But uh, there's next time, so we'll be, we'll be back. Well, as always, even when you lose, it's done with great style. Thank you, Steve. What a sportsman Joe Amato is, and what an addition he has been to the top fuel ranks. But right now, it's all Big Daddy. Don Garland's proudly showing low elapsed time and top speed of the event. That's worth points towards a world championship. But more importantly, you kept Amato out of the final. That's what you're going to have to do from now on. That's right. He's, he's, he's way ahead, and we got to slow him down a little bit. And that I was really hoping that I was going to be able to do that. Of course, we hadn't been having a good day, but all of a sudden, his day turned around. And as is in drag racing, you know, you have ups and downs. Downs. <laughs> well, this is definitely an up. Where did all that performance come from? You wouldn't believe. We put, well, we put another transmission in it. You know, we're having backup troubles, and I'm wondering if there wasn't some problems in there. And, of course, that's what hurt the engine on the run before. The time that the delay, while they were pushing the car back, it actually hurt the engine. And then we made the run against Coletta. There wasn't nothing you could do. But that time, you know, it backed up perfect. Me and Joe went right up to the line. Everything was fine. These engines are very critical on heat. You're excited, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> Big Daddy, the winning Australian. Greg Rosser Mall can still get excited going into a final round. Look at him beam. <laughs> well, we're beaming too because it's going to be a couple of veterans, a couple of good old boys, Mullins versus Garlitz in the finals for Top Fuel here at the Cajun Nationals. I'm here at Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's time for the semifinals of Funny Car Competition in the 7-Eleven Cajun Nationals. And two very distinctively different personalities. Kenny Bernstein in the far lane, in the near lane, John Force in the Corvette-bodied car. That is Austin Coyle, the crew chief we were talking about earlier for John Force. Now, Austin does a lot of things on that starting line, and they communicate with hand signals. You saw him back of the car up now, bringing it forward. He'll decide whether they need to make another little short burnout or not, because burnouts can be hard on the clutch. And he'll also watch those tires very carefully as John does that little dry hop to see how the tires grip. And then with another hand signal, he'll tell John how hard to bring that car off the starting line. Now, Kenny Bernstein's Ford Tempo, well, it's rumored that a lot of this car is computer controlled. We took a look at that earlier. Dale Armstrong on the starting line, he'll simply back Kenny up. That's about it. Two interesting contrasts with these drivers, Steve. Bernstein, of course, an entrepreneur in his own right, got rich in the restaurant business and backed off a little bit in his drag racing activities as we watch Austin Coyle uh, back up Force, who is a full-time, hardcore, traditional drag racer. John Forrest has literally clawed his way to the professional rank. He was a truck driver and part-time drag racer for many years. He went out and very aggressively solicited sponsors without even a national event to his credit, but just through perseverance and hanging out in a lot of offices and just saying, I'm not leaving till you talk to me. John Forrest has made a career out of this. Now, Austin Coyle gave John an OK signal, meaning hit it as hard as you can off the starting line. They are staged and ready. They live right together. But up in smoke goes John Forrest. He is trying to drive that car while it blazes the tires. Now there's smoke out of the exhaust pipes of Kenny Bernstein's car. But he wins it at 6.09, 185 miles an hour. But hurt a motor, I guarantee you. Well, Austin Carl may be rethinking that. Had he given him the sign to take it easy, he would have beaten Bernstein because Bernstein's motor broke at the other end and a conservative pass by Force would have won that race for him. Okay, Jim Head getting ready to go and you can count on a conservative drive out by this man. That is his stock and trade. And he saw, of course, Force go up and smoke. So he knows this race track is treacherous and doing a three. He is also in Force's lane. So that will make Jim had even more conservative as Ron Carretti and the Captain Crazy crew. They have never been conservative in their entire career. They're going to go at it as hard as they can. Okay, Kenny Bernstein looking over that damaged engine. Well, Kenny, not really uh, what you wanted performance-wise, but you get the finals. That's what's important. Well, yeah, but we got a lot of work to do. All right, Kenny Bernstein, Dell Armstrong, and crew headed back. They popped that motor. They know it. Kenny jamming in the rig. We'll check on them in the pits. Okay, Bernstein back with a lot of work. Captain Crazy, Ron Kareni, ready to go. This is as far as they've gone in a major NHRA event in a long time, Steve. I'll tell you what, if I was Ron Kareni strapped into this rolling bomb, I'd be a little concerned about that crankshaft we talked about, even though they think they've got a handle on it. Boy, crankshaft troubles, that's really frightening. 
Jim had. We saw him working on the car with his crew. They seem to be pretty well buttoned up, and we talked about the conservative run. There goes that out a little early. Caretti very near the center line. He holds on, though. The car stays together, but it's Jim Head. Jim Head with another one of his patented 590s, a 593 to be exact, a good speed of 245 miles an hour. And Jim Head, for the second year in a row, goes to the final round. With one of his trademark straight ahead drives, but full marks go to the captain, Crazy Crew, and Ron Carretti. They gave it a super try, went all the way to the far end before it was decided, and the motor stayed together. So, a disappointed Ron Carretti out of it, but an excellent day overall for him. You know, at this point in the race, we're usually pretty preoccupied with winners, but my friend Ron Carretti, you put up such a fight that I just gotta say goodbye. I'm tired. <laughs> I have to give in. We, uh, Crank was hurt a little bit that time, you know it was, and I, I didn't want to push it too hard. I didn't use our button that time. <laughs> but, uh, Being the high speed. Right. I just thought maybe he, he ran good, boy. I, I don't know what he ran, but he left me pretty, he left me in the mid-range real bad. So I didn't feel there was any chance of catching him anyway. Well, the way you guys battle could be a sign of some good things to come. Yeah, I think we'll make it. <laughs> Thank you. Ron Kareni, they threw everything at him they had, and he just survived. <laughs> Oh, you can count on him being back. Those guys have got to be happy with that performance. But Jim Head will go into the finals against a very apprehensive Kenny Bernstein because he came back to the pits. Dale Armstrong and the crew tore that motor apart, and it is one hurt buckaroo. They got some problems, and they've got a race against time to get ready before their matchup in the funny car finals against a very confident Jim Head, who, by the way, has lane choice on an increasingly treacherous state capital dragway. We'll see that confrontation and the Pro Stock Final coming up. 11-11 Cajun Nationals Pro Stock Finals as Ada Glidden, Bob's wife, guides him in for the water burnout. And what a role this extraordinary lady has had in his success. It looks like I'm starting to specialize in sit-down indoor interviews. You have a keen grasp because the heat and the humidity is getting to this television reporter and maybe even a little bit to this uh, pro stock crew chief, Edda Glidden. Boy, it's bad, huh? Yes, the humidity is, I think, the worst part about it. You know, going into this final against Warren Johnson, no pun intended, but you're not exactly in the driver's seat. Uh, you're right. <laughs> we need to find a little bit. Uh, we've been running reasonably consistent, and uh, the car is working really well. We're really pleased with the, the way the car works. We're just not pleased with our ETs. You'd like another tenth? Um, I'd like a tenth, but I'd take 500. 500 in a good light. Yes, in a good light. <laughs> Definitely. Well, this is going to be an interesting one. These guys have raced each other hundreds of times, Steve Evans. But I would give the edge slightly here to Warren Johnson. That's based only on a lapse time. But when Bob and Etta and Sons, Billy and Rusty put their mind to it, they may have found that 500 they're looking for. This could be won or lost right on the starting line. The Pro Stocks, when they come up, they bring the RPMs up to about 8,500 and just sidestep the clutch. They are violent off the starting line. Both of them moving up the stage, neither in a, a particularly big hurry. They'll be in a hurry with that light flash of yellow. It is Bob Glenn off the mark left first, but here comes that Oldsmobile Calais. It is Johnson. Johnson by a fender at 761 to a losing 767. Good race. All these pro stock races are so close, but a 761, 178 miles an hour. What a stout run by Warren Johnson. And as you said, Steve, it usually is decided in the first 20 feet. Bob Gooden may be a little edge off the line, but of course, Warren Johnson, that big 500 cubic inch Oldsmobile, just pulled Glidden on the top end, and that carved out a half a car length victory for Warren Johnson. Cajun Nationals Pro Stock Champion, Warren Johnson bails out a beautiful 761. Thank you. That was low ET for eliminations, I believe. I felt like a real good pass. Uh, we made some adjustments because the track cooled down, and I think it paid off. He had you just a couple of hundreds off the mark. Didn't take you long to make it up. I felt he would because uh, we've noticed that all week long. We made some changes that the car was a little lazy off the starting line as far as reaction times are concerned, but we didn't have the tire shake phenomenon that we've had at some of the other tracks, and we gave up a little bit there to gain a whole bunch down the racetrack, and it paid off. That's two this year? Two this year so far. All right. There may be more in this man's future. Warren Johnson. What a hard-working professional. Most of his efforts done in the shop. 
whereas most of the funny car and top fuel work done right here at the racetrack. Warren Johnson will put his car on the trailer, go home a winner. But let's see what's going to happen at Kenny Bernstein. He is in a major thrash to get that car ready. Well, Brock, you seldom see this crew get behind, but they are right now. There's a lot of work to be done on that Ford Temple. But on the other hand, things are not all that smooth in the Jim head pit. He looks to be just about as far apart as Kenny Bernstein is, and he doesn't have the same kind of manpower that Bernstein enjoys. So NHRA has decided to break with tradition a bit here and run the top fuel final before Funny Car. Now, this has happened before quite a few times, but usually because of impending darkness or weather. So that is the black anodized nose of Big Daddy Don Garlett's top fuel director, and he is getting ready to go, fired up and ready against Bill Mullins. Look at him check those rear view mirrors. He's looking at the header lights, seeing that the engine is running clean. The only top fuel director I have ever seen with rear view mirrors. Garlett's has been using them for years. They look like they came off about a 49 Ford. You know, Garlett's <laughs> hate new parts. <laughs> But a lot of people may think he uh, would use those to view the competition. But uh, as you say, it's strictly to look at those headers and to see how those uh, that engine is behaving. As we watch Bill Mullins back up after his burnout, it's going to be an interesting confrontation. Not exactly senior citizens here, but two guys with decades of experience. Of course, the big reputation naturally goes to Big Daddy Don Garlitz, acknowledged to be one of the great geniuses of this sport. And nobody knows that better than Don Perdome. There's no words really to describe it. It really is. You know, he, uh, Don Garlis came into this race uh, uh, really looking bad. You know, he, had a, he was really troubled in qualifying, and uh, he finally got in the show. But uh, as a Don Garlis follower, I, I knew he would be in a uh, terrific form come race day. You're a big fan of his. Yeah, I really am. You know, uh, we go back a long, long time. Connie Coletta, Don Garlis, uh, a lot of us. And uh, I, I've watched him through the years. And, uh, and, and really, when I was running drag shows, I always tried to pattern myself uh, uh, after Garlis, because I uh, I thought he was uh, the king of drag racing, and of course still is. You had a funny line about computers when you first came out of there. <laughs> well, you know, in drag racing these days, uh, and us included, we, we all fool with computers. Uh, Kenny Bernstein carries one on his car, uh, several of the fuel dragsters and so on, and, and it seems to be a new age, but... Don Garlis can uh, jump up with the computer in his head and, and run. Uh, he's he just a, a self-made computer, really. I think he'll win it. Oh, hands down, I think he'll win it. Uh, the only thing that would stop him is, uh, is, uh, is a, a failure uh, mechanical. But uh, as far as uh, having his act together, he does have that. And it's a sight to see him work on an engine, Steve Evans. Not a wasted motion. Don Garlitz has a chance right here to win two major NHRA events in a row. He won in Atlanta a few weeks ago. They are off the mark right together. An advantage to neither driver. Here they come across the finish line. Now, the crew is a little bit stunned here because there was no wind light. Now there's a little fire, in fact, a pretty good size fire under Mullen's car. Apparently, a misaligned photo cell at the finish line. There are no elapsed times recorded and no wind light. But we know who won, don't we, Brock? We sure do. And it's the old man, Big Daddy Don Garlic. He maybe has a wink in terms of reaction time on Mullins, but for all intents and purposes, an even start. But right there, you see that black dragster in the left part of your screen begin to eke out a little bit of an advantage. It's a close race, but it's Big Daddy by almost a full car length to win here at Baton Rouge. Some controversy here as NHRA has not officially yet declared a winner in the top fuel final. I have a feeling that this man, Don Garlitz, may know more about this situation than anybody else. And apparently, Don... They did not get a wind light. I'm not sure, but that would that seem logical. Well, I was there first, but there was a cone in my lane. In other words, one of the top end cones was laying in my lane. I had to drive around it. Probably one of the pro stock cars well, parachute sucked it I out. I guess it did. I don't know. But I won the race. It wasn't, he wasn't even there. Okay, well, let me tell you, that's your 25th NHRA national title. Thank you very much, Steve. And it went so ragged in qualifying and so strong in eliminations, as we've talked so many times. You said yourself you're a slow starter and a strong finisher. Well, sometimes, you know, it, uh, it's hard to get a handle on these things. <laughs> well, congratulations again. A great race. Don Garlett says he won it. I'll buy it.
<laughs> we'll buy it too. Big Daddy wins another one. We've got funny car finals coming up here at the 7-Eleven Cajun Nationals. 11 NHRA Cajun Nationals, the funny car final. Kenny Bernstein, they really had to thrash to get this car together. His competition, well, it was no easy job for Jim Head and his crew either. Now, we've talked before, Brock Gates, you know the drill as well as I do. Head is going to go out there and probably run about a 590. If Bernstein makes a mistake, he's gone. Well, all the rules have been thrown out, really, Steve, because both these guys had to thrash so hard to get ready. So all the kind of reputations for consistency, I suppose, uh, are, are a little bit in, uh, a little bit suspect at this point. I have to agree completely, Brock. This is the third final round that Kenny Bernstein has appeared in this year. He's won the previous two. Let's see if he can do it again. You saw his crew in the background there. You talk about their fingers crossed. They don't have the confidence that they usually do. Off the mark together. Second ever NHRA national event. The Cajun Nationals is his at a typical Jim Head 5.93. Same ET as his uh, run in the semifinal. So consistency pays off. It was Kenny Bernstein that uh, unfortunately made the mistake against the machine like Jim Head. Let's take one more look at him. It was really over before it started. It looks like Kenny's running on four right from the beginning. Jim Head just drives away. It was over really before it started. A big win for Jim Head. Jim Head, you missed by a fraction last year. Not this year. Yeah. What a run. You never did. Who cares? Who cares? Right. It was kind of hurt, so I'm just glad to be here. Was, did you see Bernstein at all? Uh, a little bit on the starting line, and then he. What happened to him? He smoked tires? I don't know. Just gave up. It was hurt, I think. His was. Mine was hurt, too, so I'm just happy to be down here. Guys like Kenny Bernstein not are racing for those valuable points and all of that. But a win like this can keep a guy like you racing financially. Well, it definitely helps. There's no question about it. And along with the valuable points and all that good stuff. We finished sixth last year. I'd sure like to move up to a few notches. I have a feeling you'll do that. Jim Head wins the 7-Eleven Cajun Nationals. Great day of racing. A lot of upsets. Not so much in top fuel where the old man wins it. Don Garlitz, Jim Head and Funny Car, Warren Johnson and Pro Stock. Our congratulations to all three of these men for winning here at the 7-Eleven Cajun Nationals. For Ed Bruce and Steve Evans, I'm Brock Yates. The executive producer.